Welcome to the Weekend University podcast, and this is your host, Niall McKeever. The Weekend University was set up to make the best psychology lectures available to the general public. To do this, we organize lecture days once per month, where attendees get a full day of talks from the UK's leading psychologists, authors, and university professors. Our podcast features in-depth interviews with our speakers, so you can learn more about their work. To keep updated on upcoming events and new lectures, you can sign up for the mailing list at theweekenduniversity.com. In this episode, we're joined by the co-founder of the Human Givens Movement, Ivan Turl. Ivan worked for many years as a psychotherapist specializing in brief therapy for depression and anxiety. In 1997, he co-founded the Human Givens Approach and has co-authored numerous best-selling books on mental health, well-being, psychology, dreaming, depression, and the origins of creativity and consciousness. In this episode, we discuss how and why the Human Givens Approach was created, the relationship between dreams and mental health, Ivan's advice for helping a close friend or a family member suffering with depression, and a whole lot more. So... I really enjoy recording this. I learned a lot and hope you will too. Enjoy the show. To get started, could you just tell me how the idea for the Human Givens approach first first came about? The the Human Givens came about because I moved into the field of psychotherapy and uh, met Joe Griffin. And he and I used to have long conversations about uh, how um, ignorant a lot of people were in training in psychotherapy about human gullibility, uh, how easy it is to influence people, um, how we go into a trance without realizing it and all this sort of thing. And we, we decided to do some training around some basic core skills to do with people working um, to try and help people, you know, so counsellors, psychotherapists, GPs, etc. We got a few people along, but not many people came really, um, because most people don't have the humility to think that they actually still have things to learn. And they think, well, I've done all this training, I've got my degree, uh, uh, I've got my status, you know, my what, what people call me, and, and um, I, uh, I don't need any extra training. So, um, we then came to a, a point where we were doing some training and some other people wanted to join us. And they were people who'd done a lot of Ericksonian hypnosis training, for example, or um, NLP, that sort of thing. And they were very taken with all this. But Joe was trying to express this idea that we've been talking about, but actually you've got to get right the way back to basics. Um, and work with, you know, what a human being actually is, what we come into the world with. And I remember him uh, surrounded by these people at this table, banging the table, saying, look, it's a given, it's a given that people need attention. It's a given that people need security. It's a given that people need to be connected to the community and that they need intimacy in their lives and they need meaning in their lives. He was saying all this, you see, and getting more. And, and these people just looked him all blank, you know, well, what's that got to do with doing therapy? You know, we've done our NLP course. We don't need to have to think, for heaven's sake, and think it'll do. But, uh, and we came out of that meeting a bit depressed in a way for a bit. But then I suddenly said, well, why don't we call what we're doing human givens? Because that people don't know what that means. And they'll ask us. And that gives us a chance to give a short explanation that it's our genetic inheritance. Our genetic inheritance is what we've been given by nature or whatever you know and um so uh we started talking about the human givens and and, and people latched onto that idea and started asking us about it and um and we we sort of went to the research and found out all the research that supported the various elements that we um were uh teaching like for example the need to be connected to a community is very well founded in, in research the need for attention that people have is very well founded um and, and and of course if you don't feel secure you get anxious and depressed very quickly 
uh, whether it's secure in your health or your finances or your relationships or uh, you know even more serious things like in, in a war zone or some horrible environment where you don't feel secure when you walk down your own street um, so all these things were very well supported and one of the biggest ones of course is people need meaning in their lives and we live in a world now where a lot of people um, have had that need for meaning undermined or, or satisfaction for that need for meaning so for example people don't have great trust anymore in politics or um, in religion you know um, and uh, or in the law so these fundamental things have um, sort of been undermined really in our culture so there's a lot of people that have a sort of postmodern view that well anything goes you know any, any if one person's view is as equal to another uh, and and there's no real truth to search for and that's really caused uh, or one of the causes for a massive amount of uh, anxiety and depression in society so anyway we, we labeled these different uh, needs and we also realize that of course we're not just uh, and they, they stem from this fundamental truth that every living thing this is a law of nature every living thing has to seek nutriment to constantly rebuild and maintain itself you know plants do animals do insects do and we do that's what that's a, a law it's fundamental to the law of gravity so these needs we feel as feelings and they are we just can't avoid them so for example you have a feeling of hunger or thirst or uh, you know uh, even more basic than that you know you panic very quickly if you can't breathe you know because that is a an emotional response so but we also have these uh, the, the higher mammals and us particularly human beings have emotional needs and these emotional needs are very important too you know so we have a need for security a need um, for control to volition um, we have uh, the need for privacy so that we can reflect on things and we have a need for attention to exchange attention you know if we if that's how families develop or any culture develops is because of an exchange of attention giving and receiving attention um, so we have a need for competence we have a need to be connected to the community we have a need fundamental need for meaning all these needs are so important that um, they should be the basis of any psychological research or intervention that they must trying to to make and so we started teaching this and, and it really it really caught people's imagination because it was a clear way of understanding um, psychology and uh, I mean it's a funny thing happened where my daughter one of my daughters did a psychology degree at Reading and she was doing this degree and we were putting on these lectures in London were day-long lectures you know sort of quite intense and interesting uh, well we thought they were interesting and so did the hundreds of people who came and um, she started I said well you know you can bring your student friends along for free you know because just just tell us and we'll let you in sort of thing uh, and um, and, and several of these students said, why can't we have lectures as interesting as this at uni, you know? <laughs> they were studying psychology, but they had discovered that psychology, you know, because psychologists want to try and make themselves a science as solid as physics or something, um, they ended up having to do an awful lot of data entry and, you know, counting and measuring and all this sort of thing, which actually isn't to do with psychological understanding. You know you can learn some things from doing that but it's not why people go and study um, psychology at university they think unless they've been very forewarned that it's going to be about relationships and why I have these emotions or why why do people get angry and all that sort of thing but by and large it isn't you know or, or why we dream you know so 
No, yeah, that, I mean, that, that, that really took off. I don't know if that's answered your question. It, it took off because people responded well to it and, and still do. Very much so. So how did you and Joe Griffin go about identifying what these core needs of human beings well, actually it, are? Joe was a, a social psychologist and had done a, an enormous amount of reading and still does. And so, uh, and, and I wasn't a psychologist, I come from a business background, but um, it, it, basically you just research it. And it's also observation, you know, I mean, I've been interested in human development since my twenties. Um, and I've been puzzled by why, when this world was so wonderful, why a young person would kill themselves, commit suicide. Because I'd experienced that at school and, um, uh, at college, you know, a chap I used to play the guitar with, one day threw himself off the roof of the college and right in, you know, th there's this huge window and he threw himself off the roof just as people inside were doing their exams, which is, you know, it's pretty horrible. And two weeks later, his girlfriend threw herself off the same roof. So, I mean, this puzzled me. Why on earth would somebody do that when I mean, it seems so much preferable in to be alive, you know? But people do, and they do it because I suppose there's no meaning in their lives. You know, they, they've, they've reached rock bottom. So I was always interested in why people got depressed um, and, and would do things like that. And likewise with Joe, he actually had examples in his family of, of um, people who died because of uh, mental illness. He had a very large family. Um, so people were responding well to a sort of, if you like, a common sense, but science-based um, approach to doing counseling and psychotherapy. And, you know, we'd get people from other fields coming along, like, you know, GPs and nurses and speech therapists and occupational therapists. They loved it because it made sense of what they were seeing and, and they could see immediately things they could do to make people's lives better. And whenever you guys started the Human Givens Institute, what were your aims? What were you trying to achieve? I suppose to, you see, if you, if you want to make anything happen, you have to sort of start an institute. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous, but I mean, you're finding this. You started up a weekend university, for heaven's sake. You, you know, if you just said, oh, I'm, uh, you know, my, I'm Neil, no one's going to listen to you. But if you say, well, I'm from the weekend university, again, it's obvious, isn't it? And I was given this advice many, many years ago that, you know, if you've got any ideas, Ivan, this chap said to me, um, and that you want to get across, you've got to start an institute because no one will listen to you as an individual. But if you say you're an institute, which is just basically a letter heading, you, you, um, you, people will answer the phone and talk to you and give you time. And it's because human beings are primitive, really, that we respond like this, because that gives us uh, a sort of artificial kudos, you know, uh, and that's, that's how things work. So we started an institute because we wanted to get these ideas out more, because we could see, um, I, I produced the first issue of the journal, I think in 1993, um, and almost immediately, somebody approached me with a document that was virtually pornographic. I mean, it was all it was really, it was dreadful. This school of psychotherapy was teaching people that the whole human race is in denial about um, sexually abusing their children. And I was appalled at this, you know. I mean, one of the things, and it said that 93% of uh, cot deaths are due to mothers sexually abusing their babies, for example. It's just horrendous stuff. And I got in touch with um, the organisations they belong to, British Association of Counselling. Uh, it's now BACP, Counselling and Psychotherapy, but it was then BAC, uh, and three or four other organisations that these teachers of this mad idea um, were uh, belonged to. And no one seemed very interested. I thought, well, this can't be, this is crazy. And I got talking to Michael Yabko in America, a very great psychologist and psychotherapist, um, expert in depression and so on. And he said, well, you know, people are creating false memories. They're creating false memories or illusory memories, he called them. 
and in America and it's wrecking families and some people are being put in, in prison because of these dreadful uh, accusations or that, that, that are deriving from therapy sessions because of some mad ideas the therapists had. So I decided very early on to put on a conference at the World Society of Med Medicine in, in um, uh, false memory, basically. It was the first, uh, 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 um, that put us on the map, you know, as a, as a kind of journal and later as an institute, people kept getting in touch with us about, about this. And it was because people don't understand how suggestible human beings are and gullible, actually. Um, and, it, you know, you can start to talk and make suggestions to somebody and then people will confabulate stories about that derive from those suggestions. Say, oh, you know, I mean, the chap that came to us with this document, he was he'd been he'd been made to sign that he wouldn't show it to anybody. And that's the sort of thing cults do. And he, um, he he said, you know, I went along and they were doing hypnosis with us all so that we could try and remember the abuse that we suffered from our own parents. And he said, well, um, he said, well, I never really got on with my dad. So I began to believe that perhaps he did abuse me. And then he said, but then they started on my mother. He said, and I knew that that was nonsense. And suddenly the, the light dawned that this was all nonsense. And he and he came and talked to me about it, and that it was it was weird and horrible all at the same time, and got me indignant, you know, because I just don't think people should uh, be controlling other people like that. I really don't, especially if they're using hypnosis, which is a powerful tool in therapy, very powerful, but it's also very dangerous, much more dangerous than people who go along and do the hypnotherapy courses realise, because. It's not in the interest of the people selling the courses to tell them that actually you're dealing with the fundamentals of a person um, and, and you know, their, their very identity. Uh, you, can, you can actually harm people using hypnosis very easily. Yeah. And I got interested in hypnosis when I broke my arm at um, school you know, and I, I smashed it really badly, fractured and broke it and uh, there was no anaesthetist available so the surgeon said can i use hypnosis on you to do the operation so and he said do you want to watch and or do you want your eyes closed and so being a boy i said well i want to watch see so I've, I've seen all my bones and bits and bobs here i think i'd be too squeamish at my <laughs> current age to do that but um i i was game for it then but i was also in a trance because i was in shock because i'd broken my arm badly and you go into shock when that sort of thing happens. Everybody does. So he hypnotized me. When I got back to school, a week or two later, my arm all banded up and in a plaster and all the rest of it, I was telling my friends that I'd been hypnotized to have the operation. The teacher actually called me a liar because he didn't believe in hypnosis. You know, he says, that's nonsense, you know, it's mumbo jumbo. But my parents knew and I knew that it wasn't. So that got me interested in hypnosis. I went along to the library, Sutton Library, and uh, got a book out on the subject. And that was my first introduction to uh, the strange workings of the human mind. Wow. Okay. So, Ivan, if somebody comes to a human given counselor with depression, for example, what approach does the counselor take to, first of all, identifying what needs aren't being met in that person's life? And then, how do they help the person start to create a plan to get those needs more, uh, more met, I suppose? Um, well, the, the first thing you, you do is you have to build rapport with them. You have, yeah, you, you have to do that because you can't make progress with anybody unless they trust you. And you build rapport. And, and we actually teach people how to, to do that fairly easy. But one, one thing you do, for example, is say to them, um, How's your sleep? See, all depressed people have bad sleep. Uh, and, they, you know, how do you wake up in the morning? Oh, I'm absolutely exhausted when I wake up. Um, and and you, then you say, and they, and they kind of know that you are latching onto something important. I mean, they don't intellectually know it, but they're, they're, you've got their attention. And then you say, have you been worrying about anything lately? 
and they'll say, I mean, I've literally had people say to me, I could worry for Britain, you know, they are warriors. Um, I mean, psychologists like to call it rumination, but actually ordinary language is better because everyone understands what worrying is. So, so they're worrying. And then you, you tease out what they've been worrying about. And it's always related to um, needs not being fulfilled in some way. And it needs because of relationship problems, money problems, health problems, work problems, problems with their children, whatever it is that they're worrying about. And, um, and when you start talking about that, you, you, they, they trust you and they know that you're onto something. And then, but only then, can you explain to them why they wake up tired. So you slip in bits of information about um, how depressed people dream much more than non-depressed people and much more intensely in the early stages of sleep particularly. Um, <clears throat> And what's dreaming for? Well, my colleague Joe Griffin actually discovered why dreaming evolved um, in animals as well. You know, it's, it's not just a human thing. Animals dream. And they go into this REM state. REM stands for rapid eye movements, as you know. Um, but it's just the visual sign that, that of a particular brain uh, activity that's going on. And and, and they dream, and they dream, what he discovered was um, resolutions, metaphorically, of um, unacted out emotions from the previous day. So they're acted out in dreams. To, but if, and normally that's sufficient uh, for, for a person who's not been ruminating or worrying excessively. You, you, but if you have an enormous number of worrying going on all day long. You've got hundreds of little dream scenarios that have to be de-aroused. Now, the thing about the REM state is it burns off energy. You know, you, we normally um, burn off, uh, if we dream for, say, 20, 25% of the night. We're in the REM state. And the rest of the time, we're in slow wave sleep, which is recuperative sleep. And recuperative sleep adds sugars to the, uh, the neurons and um, replenishes all sorts of things you know cells are mended and it's replenishing so you wake up and builds energy where well, you wake up refreshed feeling raring to go but if you're getting a lot of dream sleep that's burning off energy um and the, so the balance of slow wave and dream sleep is distorted you wake up tired because you haven't really dealt with all those things and then that makes you feel bad so you worry about that so it's a cycle that goes on and we defined the cycle of depression for the first time. So it basically starts with um, innate needs not being met. People start to worry, that produces emotions uh, uh, that are not acted out. You see, if you're worried about something, suppose you're worried about your finances. If you don't do anything about it, it's going to niggle and niggle. And then you're, you know, people get depressed. But if you pick up the phone and talk to your bank manager and say, look, I can't pay the mortgage this month. What am I going to do? And the bank manager says, well, we can reschedule. We can do this. We can do that. And you take some action. Your arousal level goes down and you won't be dreaming about it that night. But if you yeah. don't take action about your relationships, your health, your whatever you're worrying about, you're in big trouble. So, uh, so you teach people about this uh, cycle, which includes dreaming too much because of the rumination so you've got to stop the, rim, rim, the worrying and that's the job of the therapist is to help um, diminish the amount of worrying a person's doing so they and, and, and get them to take action physical so, action, be out fo focused outwards if somebody listen is listening to this and they tend to worry a lot what advice would you give to them to help them stop worrying so much well talk to somebody who isn't a worrier who isn't going to reinforce that uh, and uh, maybe seek some therapy but the trouble with a lot of counseling and psychotherapy as we found is that it actually encourages introspection you know this, this is one of the harmful things about certain styles of therapy so basically do something solve a problem do some work get out, um, help other people, serve other people, um, 
so, so because if you're it, it's where you put your attention if you put your attention on what you're worrying about um you're burning yourself up you're killing yourself effectively you know you've got to put your attention what is uh, outwards um on solving problems getting your needs met helping other people taking part in community life etc etc and that will keep you sane and it will stop you ruminating because um you know if you're doing that that takes your time uh, your energy and your attention so you haven't got any to, to spend on what is essentially a selfish activity focusing on my feelings all the time me 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 which is what depressed people do um what would you say the most the most unmet needs in our society today are um the need for meaning i would say is probably um because say look at things like iphones and ipads and facebook and twitter and all those things they're capturing people's attention and so their attention isn't focused on getting their real needs met um and i think that's a big problem for society and you know there's lots of research coming out now how young people in schools and colleges and universities um are not functioning very well because of this you see we, we come into the world with a limited amount of attention every morning you know we wake up it's a form of energy and if we just are constantly peering at our iphones and um uh you know how many likes i've got and all that stuff that people do um you're not actually living you're not really living you're not really questioning the universe and connecting up to something bigger than yourself and you need to do that you know human beings have a sort of uh, this is a cliche i suppose and it, it, but they have a sort of divine spark in them that wants to know that really wants to know but if you um subsume that in in the world of technology and with marvelous things and all the rest of it uh iphones and ipads and all the rest computers like we're using now wonderful up to a point but if they are stopping us getting our need for connection to the community the real community i'm not i'm talking about real people you know not on facebook or something um you you actually take away the drive that people have to develop to really develop and, and so development then becomes a sort of a cliche thing like oh i'll go and do a mindfulness course or i'll do this that, and the other but it's not about development you know it might calm you down or has some beneficial effects but it's not what the human beings are here for yeah very interesting what are your thoughts on antidepressants and the idea that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance in the, in the human brain well, again, that's an idea that was promoted very, very strongly by pharmaceutical companies because it suited them to do so because they big profits are involved. But actually, the chemical there's no such thing as a chemical balance in the brain. I mean, that's the, the chemistry in the brain is constantly fluctuating. You know, it fluctuates with what food you eat, um, with how much sunshine you get, with um, you know how happy you feel in a relationship, or um, you, you know. Uh, sexual enjoyment and so on this is changing the chemistry in the brain continually so um to, to, to say that depression is caused by chemical imbalance is just nonsense what happens is when people get depressed the chemistry does change of course it does so you, but it's not it's, it's not it's not a cause it's just a description of what's happening in the brain all the time anyway so um however antidepressants have helped some people so you can't sort of say oh, all on antidepressants are bad because they help people for a number of reasons one is they they certainly uh, act as a good placebo to those people that believe in them and and calm them down so that they can get on with their life and then stop being depressed that's that's true um and they they do have some value um but the idea that oh i just need to take antidepressants and to put children on antidepressants i think is a crime really that's you know if you were to ask me i, I just think that's ridiculous what's wrong in that child's life what needs 
uh, not being met that's making it worry why is why is it anxious all the time why is it wetting the bed why is it doing that? don't give it antidepressants that's terrible yeah what advice would you give to somebody listening to this who might have a family member who is suffering from depression for example well my first thing i say is try and understand the human givens and, and and so that you can be more objective about looking at um <clears throat> this person's life this dear person is dear to you look at their life and see what it is they're worrying about i mean essentially depression is caused by worrying um, uh, and and that can affect the body cause inflammation and, uh, and all sorts of things so uh which gives people more things to worry about and damage them physically so it's just get more knowledge basically i mean we've put out enough, uh, enough knowledge out there we've got online courses we've got books uh, websites on depression and so on find out about it and don't just accept what you're fed by people in the nhs i mean the nhs is a in many ways a wonderful organization but um it, it it's not a blanket good you know it depends on the individuals you meet who work in the nhs how good those individuals are uh, that, that counts um so if, if somebody if, if you suspect well actually that doesn't make sense to me what that person just said trust your instincts it probably it probably isn't right you know uh, but you can only judge people by gaining information yourself first you can't you need information about innate needs and innate resources and what depression is and and so on before you can help somebody don't just because somebody's wearing a white coat or is, is called a doctor just assume that they know what they're talking about because they don't always some of them do some of them are brilliant but some of them are awful yeah and Ivan, what role can imagination play in helping people overcome mental health problems well <clears throat> why not one of the most powerful things you you can use in doing therapy and counseling is known as guided imagery where you you get the person um to calm down you deeply relax a person and then you start making little suggestions like for example you could say to somebody when they're in a sort of trancey state look neil you didn't come into this world depressed and miserable and tired all the time you you came into this world bright eyed keen to explore keen to understand clean to, keen to make friends you wanted to connect up to the world that's the real you not this depressed person the real you is the person that came into this well wide-eyed and alert and keen to explore and to clean to live a good life a full life that's the real you and if you say that to someone um in in a trancey state in guided imagery their brain starts to seek out um the the the, the, the necessary fuel if you like to get those needs met that they had when they were a child you know they came into the world they wanted to walk and talk and uh, play and connect up and learn you know human beings are learning machines i mean we really are learners par excellence uh, in, in the animal kingdom we can and that's what children want to do unfortunately a lot of that is that desire to learn and connect up is destroyed when children go to school because everything becomes very regulated and um, there's a schools can do a lot of damage to the human race but it's difficult to know how do you manage all these children <laughs> you've got all these children and the parents have to go off to work so we end up with an education system and the, and the, the fact that it's called a system should be a big clue as to there's something fundamentally wrong because education is not really a system it's really um bathing in uh, experiences and facts and knowledge and uh, learnings from all sources not just a curriculum that you have to follow because the government says this is a curriculum and you're going to be tested on it so i mean education is doing a lot to damage mental health in this country yeah 
Now, Ivan, can you tell me about a time in your own life when you experienced, experienced something really difficult and, and how you overcame it? And maybe could you talk about the importance of actually having difficulties and problems in your life as well? Uh, well, the thing about difficulties is, on the whole, they're jolly good. You know, it, 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 what difficulties you have to overcome, you know, which can be in relationships, in business, in health, um, they strengthen you. You know, if, if you give in to them, you, you become anxious and depressed. So I suppose one of the first big difficulties was with going to school at all. You know, I hated it because, you know, the sun was shining. I wanted to climb trees when I was little and, and play and, and be with my mates, you know. Um, but so that was a big difficulty. You ha had to kind of knuckle down, as they say, and, um, and, and just do all the things that you were asked to do um, so that you could get out at the end of the day and go home and play and do the things you've been wanting to do all day long. So that was a big difficulty for me. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I've had difficulties like everybody. I mean, you, but generally, they, they are, it, there's always afterwards you think, if you have a business failure, for example, um, you learn from it. Uh, you, you learn an enormous amount. If you talk, I've spoken to dozens and dozens of business people uh, who's, who've been successful, but they've all had failures in, in their business career. And they said that that was the most valuable part of becoming successful was the failures they had. And you, I mean, in therapy, if you, if you meet somebody and they've had a terrible relationship and perhaps they've been abused or whatever, but you can say to them and you should say to them, you'll never make that mistake again, will you? You'll learn from that. So you reframe even terrible things as a learning experience. And I think that's true, you know, I mean, uh, I've had health problems, relationship problems, and business problems, and it's all grist to the mill, isn't it? I mean, we come into this world and we need, uh, we need difficulties, you know, we're a problem solving creature, we actually need problems. I mean, when, when you say that, some people look at you, I don't need any problems, I want my life to be perfect all the time. Well, that's ridiculous. In fact, we, you know, problems get the brain working you've got to solve problems um you you've got i mean there's an old saying which i love it comes from the middle east that and it just shows there's a lot of wisdom in ordinary people that if you've got no problems buy a goat because that'll give you problems you know and so it, it, they're, they're wonderful um source of materials these old sayings that are psychologically very astute and that's one of them we do need problems we need them because uh, without problems, we've got the brain's got nothing to work on, and the brain needs to be kept busy. Yeah. Are there any books that have had a big impact on your own, your own life and your own worldview? And are, are there any books that you recommend that other people should read? Uh, well, if you're talking about psychology and psychotherapy i would recommend obviously the, the book the, the two books that we've written which are about those subjects what one is about um is the human givens book uh, which is a new approach to mental health and our ability to think clearly about things and the other one is um godhead the brain's big bang which is takes a much bigger view about meaning in in life over the last forty thousand years and people who read it find it um incredibly helpful many people have read it several times um i wish we hadn't called it godhead because i think people think it's overtly about religion but it's not it's it's um it's about the god in our own heads you know what we what human beings do to the universe is we reflect back to the universe what we've discovered outside of uh because we kind of escape time you know we're time travelers you know we with the human imagination can look into the future animals don't do that we can do that we can plan we can think about com uh, bigger contexts in from the past and into the future about what's going on um so those books for people interested in the psychology and the casualty of evolution like um schizophrenia and people suffering from schizophrenia or people suffering from severe autism. Um, why, why those things evolved in human beings, that's all in the Godhead book. 
Um, what, but, what was uh, the brain's big bang? The brain's big bang was when we suddenly accessed, in, instead of in dreaming, um, uh, we act, have bit, the sort of consciousness that we have in dreaming, we could suddenly be conscious outside of dreaming. And so language developed very quickly. Uh, the arts developed very quickly. Um, people, you know, archaeologists said, well, they call, use this term, the brain's big bang, about 40,000 years ago. And, it, and there were kind of precursors of that in the previous sort of 100,000 years. But basically, suddenly there was a great flowering of um, culture, as you know, you know, all the paintings and drawings and sculptures and carvings that have been discovered from a, going back to about 40,000 years ago. It was a wonderful thing, thing to think about. Um, and the, the idea that without a touch of psychoticism and a touch of autism, people wouldn't have done those things. You know, they came about because of this fra slight fracturing of just being an ordinary animal, just eating and consuming and mating and all the rest of it. We were able to do something extra, become philosophers, artists, um, thinkers, and so on. So that, that happened about, about 40 odd thousand years ago when we became great storytellers. But um, for another book that I would recommend to people who are interested in meaning is a book by somebody uh, who I got to know called Idris Shah, and that's the Sufis, which I read in the 1960s. It still sells very well, and it's an absolutely stunning book and I've read it about 20 times and more and um, uh, he was he was he he wasn't a culty person at all and it's none of this whirling dervish stuff or anything with him but it was it was a, aimed at bringing ancient wisdom in in and connecting it up to modern psychology and um, understanding scientific understanding and he did it brilliantly and that book sort of takes you into a world where you realize gosh there's been people alive on this planet who knew so much more than most people do today about uh meaning you know what we're here for what's life all about all that sort of thing uh so i would recommend that book the sufis but i mean i've read lots of other stuff as well which is also interesting but great um Nearly finished, Ivan. Just a couple more questions. Uh, for someone, someone listening to this, what are some simple, simple, practical things they can do today to start improving their emotional well-being? Well, one very useful and important thing is to consider where you put your attention, where you focus your attention. I mean, if, if you're wasting your attention energy, which is what a lot of people do, um, you won't develop uh, as a rounded individual. Um, you know, like I was talking about people wasting their attention on iPhones and Facebooks and all that sort of thing. Um, you've only got a limited amount of that and you need to think very seriously what you want to do with that attention capacity that you have. So that's one tip. Think seriously about attention and, and be aware that People are harvesting your attention. They're trying to sell you stuff all the time by harvesting your attention online. Um, that's a very serious thing. And the other thing is just to, to read widely about what people actually need. You know, it's, it, have a, an understanding of innate needs and innate resources in human beings so that you can understand your own behavior better and the behavior of the people around you. And the people, if you're in therapy or want to be a therapist or a doctor or a nurse or whatever, so you can have a better understanding of people um, and not just react emotionally all the time. Emotional arousal makes us stupid by and large because it, you know, it focuses, emotions always focus attention. And when your attention is focused, uh, it, you can't see the bigger picture. And a human being who's sort of fairly developed well is able to focus their attention at will and then defocus it to see the bigger attention so you focus on solving a little problem but then you step back in your mind and see a much bigger context and the ability to do that freely 
uh, is, is what self-development's about. It's focusing and defocusing attention. Um, you never see the bigger context unless you defocus your attention. So if people are just put all their attention on making money um, or, you know, seducing people or um, being entertained all the time, and that's, you know, their attention is taken up by entertainment all the time. There's nothing wrong with entertainment, but everything in proportion, you know, so be, be aware of your attention and be aware of what people need and what you need and learn about it, you know, really understand it. And not just think you understand it because you've read a book. You've got to, you've got to experience it out in the world with other people. It's experiencing and observing. That's great advice, Ivan. Thanks for sharing. Have you got any thoughts for somebody that's, listening to this you're considering a career in either psychology or psychotherapy uh any thoughts about that well be very very careful because you can get sucked in i mean one of the things that interested me when i started um having a sort of career change and getting interest in psychotherapy was how culty so many um types of psychotherapy trainings were very culty and i didn't like that at all um, I've sort of been inoculated uh, against cults by Idris Shah, you know, just talking to him because he said he, he was explaining how cults work. And Arthur Dykeman, who's wrote a book called Them and Us, which is how uh, cults work. And I, and I find, I found that you know, if you talk to psychotherapists, they come in different schools, but actually, you should call them different cults because that's mainly what they are. You know, they've got their hero figures and you know, their founders, uh, the Jungians and the Freudians and, uh, and, and all the rest, you know, Fritz Perls and all these people who are very, themselves, very often quite damaged people um, and didn't help many people. But, um, you know, if you read the history of all psychotherapy, it's disastrous, most of it. Freud never cured anybody. There's no record of him curing anybody, for example. And yet people still talk about Freud as the father of therapy, you know, some great hero. But in fact, he was pretty disastrous. So um, disastrous and from the point of view of effectiveness. Um, I've forgotten your question now, Neil. What was it? Oh, yes. If people were thinking about, well, to... to to keep an open mind, don't get sucked into things too easily. Don't get sucked into an NLP cult or a hypnotherapy cult or a psychoanalytical cult or a person-centered cult. Um, take a, a bigger view, which is what we think we've offered with the human givens. It's, it's a more rounded, it's a more holistic approach to what people need and what happens when things go wrong to people. So I'd suggest that they get in touch with Human Givens College. But um, you could say, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? Because I'm part of Human Givens College. Well, yes. But, um, you know, it's, it was set up for a reason. Yeah. And uh, last question, Ivan. Uh, what, what does the future hold for the Human Givens Institute? And what would the implications be if these ideas were to be adopted on a society-wide scale? Um, well, I mean, we like a better understanding of psychology and, uh, and, and innate needs and innate resources in human beings to be more widely understood. So we'd like to see it in taught to children and young people. We'd like to see it in, um, in, in the NHS. We'd like politicians to have an understanding that they shouldn't make policies that are going to inhibit people from getting their needs met. Um, which they do at the moment. Uh, for example, it's a innate need um, to feel you have control over your life, a degree of control. I mean, not be a control freak, but to have volition. Um, and it didn't surprise me at all that in the Brexit campaign, you take back control was a very successful campaign message, you know, because people don't feel they've got control over so many aspects of their life. So very powerful. Um, so, uh, we, we're taking this, my colleague Joe is taking these ideas into business because it's the way businesses are run and managed and the stress that they produce that causes a lot of 
uh, anxiety disorders and addictions and depression and so on in the business world. I'm working with a, a diplomat uh, and, and other friends, journalist friends, um, in the Conciliators Guild, which is taking these ideas into politics and conflict areas in, you know, in the Middle East and elsewhere. Um, so we're traveling around giving workshops to take these ideas beyond the therapy and counseling, uh, way beyond that, into helping people think more clearly about what people need in different cultures. And when cultures and people can come to blows, what you can do about it by having a better understanding. I mean, the human race, I, I mean, if these ideas, they have to survive the death of me and Joe and others that are teaching it at the moment. If the ideas have any value, they'll stick. If they don't, they'll just become a footnote in history. Well, that's fair enough. That's how things work. But at the moment, they have enough power and enough um, truth in them to help an awful lot of people. And that's what's in, in a lot of different fields. And that's what's happening. Yeah, definitely. And Ivan, where can people find more information about the Human Givens Institute online? Uh, well, <clears throat> Dr. Google will usually tell you, you put in Human Givens Institute and it'll come up and you, you can go on there. And Human Givens College, if you're interested in training, um, because Human Givens College, uh, the institute is, is for members and has a lot of information on it. And Human Givens College is about training. And you can do online training uh, and, and then come to actual events and workshops where you learn the skills and you can do a, di a, a diploma. And it's uh, people who get on our register as fully qualified human given therapists. Um, their register is uh, accredited by the Professional Standards uh, Authority, which is the same body that accredits, for example, BACP and all the other types of um, therapeutic approaches so uh, get on that register if you're really keen to help people using um, these kinds of ideas um, and the, the learning the techniques but also the you know, having the understanding and also have the humility to know that however much you know now there's still more to learn yeah definitely well Ivan thanks so much for for taking the time to share some of your knowledge with us I really appreciate it and we'll speak soon all right yeah okay Take care. Bye. Thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget that you can win a three-month pass worth £150 to the Weekend University if you subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. And if you're interested in keeping up to date with new psychology lectures and upcoming events, you can sign up for the mailing list at theweekenduniversity.com.